Well, good morning. How are we doing, Bridgeway? We doing all right? All right. Hey, it is good to see you. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, that's where we're going to be. So if you've got a Bible or Bible-equipped mobile device, we'd like to invite you to go there. If you're using a Bible underneath the seat in front of you, we're on page 1170. If we haven't met, my name is Brian. I am one of the pastor's here, and one more quick announcement as you're uh, opening your Bibles is uh, you just heard Easter's coming up. It's going to be just an amazing weekend around here at Bridgeway. We're looking forward to welcoming a whole bunch of people to our uh, campus to hear the good news of Jesus' resurrection, and we're doing extra services, and that means extra opportunities uh, to be involved and to serve as part of Easter weekend. We've got uh, some opportunities to serve in our Kids Way department, and then also some behind-the-scenes stuff with our creative arts department. So if you're going to be around on Easter weekend and you'd be willing to serve for a service, we'd sure appreciate it as once again, we're going to be welcoming uh, a lot of folks to our campus. And if that is of interest to you, you can go to bridgeway.church forward slash volunteer. And there's a very simple form that you can fill out. Uh, Once again, that is bridgeway.church forward slash volunteer volunteer. All right, that is it for the announcements. Let's get into God's Word. We are in part 12 of our series called Discovering the Kingdom as we've been walking through the book of 1 Corinthians line by line, and I have entitled this message, Undivided Devotion. Undivided Devotion. And throughout the series so far, if you're new or if you haven't been around for the last few weeks, what we're doing is we're trying to explore, as we study this letter of 1 Corinthians, we're trying to explore what is the kingdom of God? What is it mean to understand and live as part of the kingdom of God? And what kind of practical difference can that make for our lives? What does it look like to view the world through sort of a kingdom of God perspective as opposed to kind of perspectives that might come a little bit more naturally to us? And these last couple of weeks, we've been in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and Pastor Lance has, has preached out of those texts, and they talk quite a bit about marriage and singleness. So Pastor Lance has talked about those subjects quite a bit in these last few weeks, and if you missed them, make sure you grab the podcast, all sorts of helpful, just kind of biblical wisdom about those subjects there. And as we close out 1 Corinthians 7 today, we're going to go through the last 16 verses of the chapter, and Paul talks quite a bit about marriage and singleness again in these remaining verses. But I want to tell you right out of the gate that I don't think this passage at its core is about marriage and singleness. Now, if we were to pause right now and I were to say, okay, just everybody go ahead and read the passage by yourself, like 30 seconds or a minute, and then we'll come back together. You would read it and every single one of you would go, you're crazy. This is obviously about marriage and singleness. What are you talking about? But it's not. It's not. What Paul is doing is he is using this idea of marriage and singleness and the questions that the Corinthians had on these subjects to make a broader point about what does it mean to be part of this thing called the kingdom of God. How does the reality that God's kingdom has come shift the way we think about everything, including marriage and singleness? And before we get into the 1 Corinthians text, I want to talk real briefly about just a small passage of scripture back in the book of Mark chapter 1. Mark is the earliest written of the four gospels, four biographies of Jesus that we have in the New Testament. And you don't need to be a Bible scholar to understand that Mark chapter 1 means we're talking about the beginning. And in verse 15 of Mark chapter 1, Jesus comes on the scene. And the first recorded words we have from him in Mark's gospel... He says, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. So he says, the time is fulfilled. And he uses this special word for time that doesn't mean like, hey, in an hour and a half's time, this is going to happen. But it's a moment in time saying a particular time has come. Things are changing. A new reality is dawning. This is a significant turning point moment in time. And that turning point moment is that the kingdom of God has come, Jesus says. The kingdom of God has come. That means, again, a new reality has dawned. So in light of that, Jesus says to do two things. Number one, he says to repent. And if you're a church person, you've likely heard that word quite a bit. Maybe you're pretty familiar with it. If you're not really a church person, you've probably heard it a little less. Or I don't know, maybe you have a negative connotation with that word. And it's certainly been abused and and misused a whole bunch over the years. But at its core, repent is a really beautiful word. It simply means to change your mind. 
So when the Bible says to repent, that is God's invitation to us to change our thinking, to change the way that we think about the world and our lives so it is more in alignment with him. And then Jesus says to believe In the gospel, or believe in the good news. What is the good news? The the good news is that God's plan of salvation has come to fruition. His son has come into the world, and he's going to live a a perfect life. He's going to die on the cross for our sins. He's going to die, and he's going to rise again. And if our faith is in him, we know that we will one day rise with him, and we will be united with our God. That is the gospel. Jesus says to believe in the gospel. But I just told you a minute ago that repentance is a matter of the mind. It's the way that we think. And isn't it true culturally, just as we're living our lives today, when we talk about what do you believe, we tend to think of that as a matter of the mind as well, don't we? Like, for example, I might say to you, I believe that Japan is a sovereign nation in Asia. And I really do believe that. However, it does not consciously influence my day-to-day decisions very much. I don't have like a sticky note on my bathroom mirror at home, like, don't forget Japan, you know. I don't like find myself about to do one thing, and then I'm like, oh, Japan, what about that? I should probably do something else. No. And choose any country you want, right? I believe Japan, you know. And that's how we think about belief, right? But when, when the New Testament, and this is, this is so much bigger than just this sermon. This is something so important to remember. When, when the New Testament talks about belief, it's not talking about intellectual agreement, Right? It's talking about, I believe this stage is going to hold my weight. I believe this roof will remain intact. I believe my belt is going to do its job today. (laughs) Glory to God. I I demonstrate my beliefs by my actions. So to believe in the gospel means to approach our lives in such a way that our faith makes a practical difference in ways big and small. To believe in the gospel is to consider how does, how does the gospel influence the way we think about our jobs and our hobbies and our possessions and money and, yes, our marriage and our singleness. See, belief is not a box we check. It's a life we live. Repentance is in the mind. Belief is not, yes, I believe this. No, no. Belief is about a life that we live. So God's invitation to us is twofold. The time has fulfilled, and Paul is going to use this same language in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So because the kingdom of God is at hand, we are invited to repent. We are invited to change our thinking. The New Testament talks about this idea of renewing our minds so that they're, they're formed by Scripture and by what the Spirit of God says to us and not by kind of the prevailing winds of culture. And we are called to believe the gospel to fundamentally change the way we live our lives, not in some effort at moral performance, but in response to who God is and what he has done. That's what it means to believe, to bring our lives into alignment with him so that they reflect his presence and his power. So with that in mind, I want to give you the fill in the blank, and then we're going to turn our attention to Paul's discussion of marriage and singleness that is not really about marriage and singleness in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Fill in the blank if you're following along with the app or with your your bulletin is, is simply this. Our relationship status offers unique opportunities for growth and service. Our relationship status offers unique opportunities for growth and service. Whether you're married or single, and the message is not about married and sing, marriage and singleness, but we're going to talk about it a little bit. There are opportunities for you to repent and believe. Now, there are opportunities for us to repent and believe that remain the same regardless of our relationship status, but there is a uniqueness that comes with each one. So with that, let's get started in verse 25 of 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We'll work our way down through verse, verse 40, stopping to make some comments along the way. Paul writes, now concerning the betrothed, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think that in view of the present distress, it's good for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. (laughs) More on that in a moment. 
Paul says, <laughs> Paul says, okay, I'm talking to the betrothed here, those who are engaged to be married or promised in marriage but are not yet married. And he's real clear. He says, listen, I don't have a clear command from God, like this is what you must do, but I'm your pastor. I want to help you make a wise decision here, and hopefully you've come to know that I'm trustworthy. And he says, in view of this current or present distress, here's what I think you should do. So two things. Number one, this is specific advice for a specific moment in time. Number two, what the heck is the present distress? See, there are some who have taken this passage to be Paul was alluding to some sort of distress that he expected to, to come upon all believers before Christ's eventual return. And then there are some who have then taken this passage to say, well, what Paul is saying is, listen, Jesus is coming back soon, so marriage, not marriage, doesn't really matter. And there are a couple of problems with that. Number one, there's not a lot of evidence to suggest that that is actually what Paul was referring to, that this is some sort of pre-end times hardship, right? And then second, even if it were, and this is just, a, once again, a big, kind of a bigger concept here, is that no place in the New Testament does, does the Bible teach that because Jesus is coming, we should disengage from our responsibilities. <laughs> Living with a sense that Jesus is coming back is like, that's part of being a Christian. We live in anticipation of his coming. But there's no place in the New Testament that endorses the idea of just disengagement. In fact, Paul also wrote a letter called 2 Thessalonians later in the New Testament. And in 2 Thessalonians 3, he criticizes this group of men who'd stopped showing up to work. Because they're like, well listen, Jesus is coming back, so what difference does it make? And Paul says, well actually, in the meantime, and I'm paraphrasing, you still need to eat. (laughs) And if you don't work, then other people are having to take care of you. So yes, Jesus is coming back, but it doesn't mean you can call in sick to work. So that's not what's going on here. What's more likely the case is we have lots of evidence to suggest that around this time, the city of Corinth was experiencing a significant famine, and they were potentially right at kind of the beginning stages of it. And I know this is going to be hard to imagine because we have not experienced anything like this as a culture now, just kind of in 2022. But there was a time in, the, in, in like way just distant past that when like broad, like kind of general cultural hardships that were a little difficult to explain and like caused people to have to make uncomfortable adjustments to their lives. Like when those things happen, there have been time in human history where like people have really kind of freaked out about that. And like kind of gotten mean and nasty and things have gotten a little bit unstable and sort of weird. Like again, we have no experience with that, so we're just going to have to imagine. But that's basically what Paul is referring to here. He's saying, listen, the current distress, we're going through a famine, there's lots of social unrest, maybe now's not a great time to get married. Maybe now's not a great time to get married. And there's a broader principle here to say that there are times where perhaps starting a new marriage is unwise. Maybe it's something broader like social unrest. Maybe it's personal other transitions in in someone's life or just life circumstances that make it unwise. But what we're going to see throughout the passage, and Paul has alluded to this in the previous passages that Pastor Lance has taught on, is that Paul's big idea here is we don't need to obsess over changing our status, married, not married, working, not working, whatever. But that instead, sort of God's invitation for us is to change our attitude about earthly things. To change our attitude about our status, whatever it is. To repent and believe right where we are. See, Paul understood we are a people who are marked for eternity. God has written eternity in our hearts. So that doesn't mean we abandon this world. But it does mean we don't let the world dictate to us what is important or how we ought to live. So in this case, in Corinth, Paul says, listen, are you married? Go ahead and stay married. Are you not married? Stay as you are. But he's clear that neither one is a sin. And I got to tell you, something I appreciate about Paul is that he has his own preferences. And he makes this clear throughout 1 Corinthians 7 that he seems to have a preference that Christians would remain like he is, remain unmarried. But he does a couple of things in advocating for this perspective that are really important. Number one, And this is, I think, again, just so many elements of this passage, like, okay, he's saying this about one thing, let's expand this and think about it more broadly. Number one, he advocates for his perspective without validating those who agree with his perspective but agree with it for really unhealthy reasons. So, for example, there were a couple of groups in Corinth, one being the pneumatics, which comes from the word pneuma, which is the Greek word where we get spirit. And they were saying that it is okay to get married, but 
you sh- your marriage should remain unconsummated because to consummate your marriage is to sin against the Holy Spirit. And Paul's like, yeah, that's garbage, and that's probably not going to fly. Right? And then there was another group called the ascetics who believed in sort of holiness through self-deprivation. And they remained unmarried because they believed that by remaining unmarried, by depriving themselves of what takes place in marriage, that somehow that made them more holy. And Paul says, no, no, your spiritual status is not determined by that. That's garbage as well. So I can appreciate that Paul is able to do this. And then secondly, Paul makes a very clear distinction between what is a moral decision and what is a wisdom decision. Paul doesn't try to moralize his own opinion. He says, listen, both of these perspectives are fine. I just want to help you make a wisdom decision. He's a good pastor trying to help his church think wisely. And listen, I got to tell you, just big picture, like it is obviously critically important that as you and I face decisions in the day-to-day, we're living our lives, making decisions, doing different things. Like, of course, we need to think through life through a moral lens. Like, what is the morally right thing to do? What does scripture have to say? What does godly counsel have to say? That's really important. But I want to suggest to you it's not quite enough. That we need to think through our decisions through a moral lens, but also a wisdom lens. Because there are, there are plenty of things that I can do that are moral, but still very stupid. And there are plenty of things where I could take some course of action and I could justify it and I could get up in front of you and say, here's all the reasons why what I did was okay. And you might even agree. You'd say, yeah, you're right. That was like, it was not morally wrong of you to make that decision, but it wasn't very smart or it wasn't very kind and it wasn't very wise. See, I love that Paul, he's a good, he's a good pastor. Again, not trying to be heavy handed about something where he has no right to be heavy handed and, and no right to make something a moral decision. But he says, hey, let's think about this through a wisdom perspective. And then, I told you, more on this in a moment. Here we go. Verse 28. Yet those who will marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. If you get invited to an engagement party, and you're just like, I'm not sure this is a great idea. Maybe just write this verse in your card and just kind of, you know, see how it goes. (laughs) I'm kidding. Do not do that. And if you do that, do not say, I told you to do that. (laughs) But there's a serious point here. Even if you've got a great marriage, I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that your marriage is at least a little bit of a source of stress in your life. Do not nod too vigorously if you're sitting next to your spouse. Your marriage is at least a little bit of a source of stress in your life. Marriage is work. It is work. You've got another person all up in your business. And they like never go away. You've got another person who you've got to spend an awful lot of time and energy thinking about, right? You are limited, as a married person, you are limited in some very real ways that you are not limited if you are unmarried. In fact, whenever I officiate a wedding, I'm looking around there, I've officiated some of your weddings. Whenever I officiate a wedding, when we get to the point in the ceremony where the bride and the groom exchange rings... I, you know, I talk about the symbolism of the wedding ring, and then I also, also say this. I say, your wedding ring is a physical, tangible reminder to you that the decisions you make don't just affect you, but they affect the person that you love the most. And if you're a married person who hasn't taken that perspective, I'd urge you to just let your wedding ring be a reminder to you of that. But for those of us who are unmarried, or if you're married and you might find yourself maybe counseling your children, you know, adult children as they're making marriage decisions, it's worth asking The question, do I feel a sense of calling to that sort of life where I have a person all up in my business, where I don't get to just make decisions only thinking about me, but I got to make them thinking about someone else, where I'm willing to invest the time and the energy to sacrifice myself to care for someone else? I don't think we answer that. I don't think we take those questions perhaps as seriously as we ought to. And the fact is, there have been some great saints in Christian history who wrote books, very prolific authors, made just a huge difference in the kingdom through, through their preaching ministry, who led revivals, who just did unbelievable missions work, but their legacy is tarnished at least somewhat because by any objective measure, it is clear they were not up to the task of being a husband. And they did great damage to their wives and to their children. And I'm not talking about men who, who, who committed in acts of infidelity. That's a whole other category. I'm talking about men who were so committed to the ministry that they were unwilling 
to care for their wives and their children. And I just look at that and go, man, there is so much needless suffering that could have been prevented if those men had remained unmarried. Marriage is wonderful and it is beautiful, but it is work. And it's just a fact of life that those who marry will face some worldly troubles. And don't worry, single people, I'm not forgetting about you. You face worldly troubles too. Just as marriage and singleness offer unique opportunities to grow and serve, they provide unique difficulties. Verse 29. This is what I mean, brothers and sisters. The appointed time has grown short. There's our word, time. We said at the very beginning, Jesus said, the time has come. That was his way of saying, things have changed. Here, Paul is using the same word, saying, the appointed time has grown short. And once again, this isn't about chronological time, like Jesus' return is imminent. We only have a little bit of time left. But rather, it's the idea that the history of salvation, the mystery of how God was going to bring about salvation, that that has come to pass, that we're no longer left looking into a mysterious future of how is God going to save the world, but he has made that known to us. Christ has come. He has died. He has risen. He will come again. God's plan of salvation has been made known. Our eternal future is now secure. The time has come, and that changes how we live in the present moment. That's what Paul's getting at here. I love how one commentary I read this week put it, says this. It says, those who have a definite future, which we have as Christ followers, those who have a definite future and see it with clarity live in the present with radically altered values as to what counts and what does not. We are invited to live with radically altered values as to what counts and what is not. And look what Paul says next. From now on, those who have wives live as though they had none. What the? Let those who mourn as though they were not mourning. Let those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing. And those who buy as though they had no goods. And those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of the world is passing away. What the heck does that mean? <laughs> Thank you for asking. Paul is not advocating detachment here. Though it clearly looks like he does. But these statements, they're a rhetorical device. They're, not, they're, they're poetic. They're not meant to be taken literally. However, there is a literal serious point behind them. And that begs the question, what is that point? Let's just take them real quick, one at a time. Number one, it means we value marriage. In fact, we highly value marriage. But we do not count it as ultimate. We understand that marriage is not a necessary ingredient for a fulfilling life in the kingdom of God. We, it, is not an, it is an important thing. It is not an ultimate thing. Right? It means we mourn. We absolutely mourn. It is so spiritually toxic. I've heard heartbreaking stories of people in times of mourning being told, no, no, you shouldn't mourn because you're a follower of Jesus or because, you know, the, because Jesus is coming back. We don't need to mourn. That is absolutely not true. That we absolutely mourn. We absolutely grieve. But what does Paul say in 1 Thessalonians? He says, we grieve but not as those who have no hope. That we grieve, but we grieve differently, right? It means we rejoice, but we take joy in our worldly victories and successes, knowing that our ultimate victory is in heaven. And I don't know if any of you are, are, are like me in this. This is going to be a little silly, so just kind of bear with me. But I don't know if any of you are like me, like me in this. If, if, you, if we know each other kind of personally, or even if you've just seen me preach, this is not going to come as a big surprise to you. But I love positive displays of emotion. Right? I just love it. I love uh, to laugh. I have a laugh that is loud, bordering on obnoxious. Uh, some would dispute the bordering on part. Uh, I love to celebrate. I love a good story. I love to tell stories. Uh, I, I love to freak out when, you know, watching sports. If there's some amazing play, man, my boys and my wife and I, after church last night, we're watching the final four. We're going nuts. It's like, that's part of the fun. When I'm coaching my kids, I'm all into it, getting excited. That's just, that is who I am. And I got to tell you, though, part of that is just wiring. I think God just made me a loud, obnoxious person, glory to God. And you can love Jesus deeply and be more subdued. <laughs> Don't hear me saying otherwise. Part of that's just wiring. But honestly, I'm able to enjoy this. I really believe this. I'm able to enjoy the joyful moments in my life because I know how to put them in their right place. I know that if those things were taken away from me, I could still have ultimate meaning in my life. I would still have ultimate purpose. 
So I get excited. I laugh. I freak out at silly things. Why? Because it's fun. But I'm not asking for it to provide me ultimate meaning. I rejoice. But as one who does not need to rejoice, who knows who does not need to rejoice to know that life has ultimate meaning. My, my expressions of joy, man, I'll tell you this, I'm not putting on a show for anybody. It is 100% genuine. But it's just fun. It's just fun, that's all it is. That's all it is. It means we buy and sell as life requires, but the things that we buy and sell don't own us. And the Greek word that Paul uses here carries the connotation of those, those who buy and sell are not owned by the things that they possess. We remember the brilliant words of Jesus who says that life does not consist in the abundance of one's possessions and we don't ask material wealth to do for us what it is utterly incapable of doing and we recognize that there is no such thing as salvation through accumulation. And then we live in the world not in an aloof or uncaring way, but in a way where we can be kind, where we can be generous, where we can contribute, where we can use our gifts, but where we're very clear that the world does not give us our sense of identity, that the world is not where we find our ultimate meaning and purpose. And listen, I understand fear sells these days. And even in the Christian world, man, you want people to follow you, start telling them to be afraid of culture, and I, just, I don't get that. But it's a very popular message even in the Christian world today. Let me be very clear. We do not need to fear culture. We do not need to fear the world. We don't need any of that. But we are very clear. We resist being formed by it. Right? Why? Because, Scripture says, the present form of this world is passing away. That's not a reference to the physical world. The Greek word there is schema, where we get the word schematic, basically saying the form, the arrangement, the way the world works is in the process of passing away. That's a literal translation. Paul's saying the way the world is organized has been fundamentally altered by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The present world is passing away. See, what Paul knew then and that what you and I need to remember now, even 2,000 years, years later and half a world away, is that we are living at a convergence of two realities, right? We live an earthly life where we buy and sell and go to work and we laugh and we cry and we do all those things. And yet the kingdom of God has come. And yet all things are in the process of being made new. That doesn't mean that this present world is unimportant, but it means we know that the kingdom of God is at hand. The futility of the world's power games has been laid bare. The futility of our obsession with approval and accumulation has been laid bare. The Bible says the principalities and powers of this world have been subjected to open shame by the cross of Jesus Christ. The kingdom of God is at hand. We're invited to repent and believe as we live at this convergence between two ages. That doesn't mean marriage is unimportant. It doesn't mean grieving is unimportant. It doesn't mean rejoicing is unimportant. It doesn't mean that we abstain from any and all buying and selling. But it means none of those things are ultimate. And there are many in this world, and perhaps many in this room, and I say this without a hint of judgment, but there are many in this world who are owned by those things, and that is an incredible burden to bear. In Christ you can be free. In Christ, you are free from your marriage being ultimate. In Christ, you are free from buying and selling and your possessions being ultimate. You are free from your grief being what defines you. You're free from just constantly chasing that next emotional high. You are free from those things. Verse 32, speaking of freedom. I want you to be free from anxieties. Wow, let's just put that on every billboard in town, shall we? <laughs> Here's what he's getting at. Paul wants us to be free from the anxieties that come from living our life as, as if any of the things we just mentioned are ultimate things. Instead, Paul wants us to have the, the peace that comes from a clear vision of our future, that we know what the future holds for us, that we will be united with Christ for eternity, that our inheritance, the Bible says, is secure, and we can live in this world with a sense of peace because of that. Now, anytime I talk about anxiety, I understand the world we're living in, so I always want to be very careful. Paul is not talking about clinical anxiety. If that is something that you struggle with, you do not now need to be anxious about your anxiety, right? That's a serious thing. And there are lots of ways to, to, get, you know, to get help. 
So, but what Paul is talking about, and the New Testament talks about when it talks about anxiety, is the hand wringing, is the worry, is the, the nervousness where we just get all spun up in our minds. I know, I'm probably the only one who does this. And it just doesn't help, right? I mean, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, he says, who of you by worrying has added even one day to your life? He just gets very practical about it, right? And even Paul, elsewhere in scripture, in Philippians chapter 4, he says, be anxious in, in nothing, but instead of just going down the wormhole of anxiety, pray. And I'm paraphrasing, of course. But when you pray, the promise is, it's God's radical alternative to anxiety because you receive his peace, peace that surpasses all understanding, and it guards our heart and it guards our mind. Paul wants us to be free from this sort of anxiety, and Paul wants us to be free from it, whether we're married or unmarried, and we can be free from this when we repent and believe the gospel. There is freedom from anxiety that comes. Let's keep going. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. This passage gets misunderstood quite a bit, and to be honest with you, I misunderstood it for, for most of my life. So we, we need to talk real briefly about what Paul is not doing here, and then we'll, we'll talk about what he is, is trying to do. So what he's not doing is he's not trying to say, well, you know, those married people, they're spiritually inferior because they're stuck, you know, spending so much of their time and energy on such worldly trivialities as, you know, a spouse, and single or unmarried people, they are spiritually superior because all they have to think about is serving the Lord. That's what I thought that passage meant for a long time. It's not what it means. We've got a couple of different good options for what Paul does mean here. And I'm going to channel my inner Pastor Lance Hahn here and give you both options. But I'm going to tell you which one I think is right at the end of it. The first possibility is that Paul is saying, listen, married people are anxious about pleasing their spouse. And that's not good. It's not good to be in a marriage and be motivated by anxiety. But you unmarried people, see some of you, you're remaining unmarried because you think that an ascetic lifestyle is somehow better or spiritually superior. So now you're anxious about that because you're sort of relying on it for kind of your spiritual strength or you're relying on it to maintain some sort of spiritual status. And Paul says, listen, whether it's your marriage or your relationship with God, it is not great for either of those to be driven by anxiety. If you're driven by anxiety in either of those environments, you're really going to have a hard time. Is that what Paul is saying? To be honest, I think so. I think that's probably the proper reading of the text, but I could be wrong. The other theory is that Paul is doing a little bit of a play on words here. And I'll spare you the very nerdy Greek lesson that kind of validates this point of view. You're welcome. But the gist of it is that Paul says, I want you to be free from anxieties. And then as he's using anxiety in the rest of the passage, what he's doing is he's using that more like not so much anxiety as much as it is deep care and concern. So it's a little bit of a play on words where he says, I want you to be free from anxieties. Even, as, even though you must be anxious about serving the Lord, about serving your spouse. Is that what Paul means? Maybe. Some people much smarter than me think so. But either way, what we can be sure about is that Paul wants us to live without anxiety when it comes to our relationship status. Paul wants us to live without anxiety when it comes to our connection with the Lord. And that that is what is most important. And look what Paul says next. He says, I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to, and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. That's it. Paul said, see, Paul's a good pastor. Paul says, listen, I'm not trying to make things harder on you. Paul says, my heart is, you, is for you to be free from anxiety surrounding your relationships or your relationship status. There were many in Corinth, just as there are many today, who believed that being married was everything. They believed their life would be incomplete if they were not married. And there were many in Corinth, and there may well be some today, who believed that kind of there was a greater spiritual power that came from remaining single, that somehow that was inherently more spiritual. And Paul says, listen, both are acceptable 
evil, neither is inherently more spiritual than the other. Live the life to which you have been called and make decisions about marriage and singleness and everything else with the best wisdom you can, but don't be anxious about it. Man, is there some wisdom in there for us. So whether you're married or single, Paul's ultimate message is that you and I, we would have an undivided devotion to the Lord. An undivided devotion to the Lord. And see, that is a kingdom perspective on marriage and singleness. It's to say, whether I'm married or unmarried, I want to have an undivided devotion to the Lord. If you're an unmarried person who is, who is desiring marriage, that is a perfectly fine desire to have. Maybe that means, what does it mean to have an undivided devotion to the Lord? Maybe it means to, to seek a godly spouse and to take practical steps to seek out a godly st- spouse, all the while refusing to allow seeking a spouse to become an all-consuming, anxiety-provoking thing. I worked with the single adult community here at Bridgeway for, for a number of years, and I always used to say, I said, listen, I, especially as a married person, I am not going to tell you how to feel about being single. That is not my place. But, and I'll, keep say, I'll say this now, I'm going to keep saying it, but if you cannot find some measure of contentment in your life as a single person, you will be discontent in marriage also. Because let me tell you, I, Desire marriage all you want, that's a good thing. I, when I was a single person, I desired marriage, but discontentment travels. And all of a sudden, all that discontentment you felt about being single, it might get relieved for a little while now that you're married, but eventually, guess what happens? Bloop, pops back up, and it's got a new target. And man, we could talk about work. If you can't find contentment in your, a little bit of contentment in your work, man, you're not going to find, we could talk about all sorts of different family arrangements. We could, I mean, retirement, uh, you name it. I'm not saying we shouldn't desire advancement or we shouldn't, you know, if you feel led to make a change, that's, you know, great. But man, if there's not a measure of contentment where we're at, discontentment travels with us, right? And so much of what 1 Corinthians 7 is about, it's about we, we, we think we just need to change our outward circumstances, but really what needs to be changed is a mindset. As a married person, to live with an undivided devotion to the Lord might mean maintaining a commitment to honor and serve your spouse, remembering, as Paul writes elsewhere in Scripture, that in marriage we are to submit to one another. Why? Out of reverence for Christ. It might mean committing yourself to the difficult work of repair and forgiveness when things get hard. Trust me, you are not the only one with marriage problems. We all got them. And so much of marriage is about the work of forgiveness and repair. If you're married to an unbelieving spouse, it might mean continually seeking to humbly show your spouse the love of God in a way that they can receive it. See, both marriage and singleness offer unique opportunities to serve and grow. But whether you're married or single, to repent and believe the gospel means to, means to believe that we have been empowered to live with an undivided devotion to the Lord just as we are. Now, before I keep going, we got to talk about this expression, an undivided devotion to the Lord. Because I'm, I'm going I'm to just hazard a guess here that some of us in this room, we hear that Paul says, I want you to live with an undivided devotion to the Lord. And some of us are like, yes, absolutely, I am all in. I am, I'm all in for Jesus. I want to live with an undivided devotion to him. Whatever that means, man, I'm going to go for it. I'm willing to do whatever it takes. But I'm going to guess that for most of us, we hear secure an undivided devotion to the Lord. And most of us, what, we, what goes through our mind is, yes, that absolutely sounds like something I should want to do. But I'm not sure that I do. And that absolutely sounds like the sort of thing that if I'm going to come to church, of course the preacher guy is going to say, you should have an undivided devotion to the Lord. Like, yes, very on brand, I would expect this. But if I'm being really, really honest, and come on, we're in church here, it's a safe place. Some of us would say, yeah, I know I'm supposed to want that, but I don't think I do. And if I'm being really honest, the reason I don't want it is because it sounds pretty restrictive. And it sounds kind of boring. And, and I just, I don't know, I just, maybe it would get weird, I don't know. It's okay, you can, if that's you, you can, you know, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but you can, you know, admit that. But here's what I really believe to be true. We think that because we don't understand what it means. I think if we really understood what an undivided devotion to the Lord looks like, and pardon the cliche, I need to hear this as much as anybody. 
if we really understood what an undivided devotion to the Lord looks like, I think our resistance would melt away. I really believe that that is true. See, God invites us to an undivided devotion to him. That doesn't mean you need to move into a monastery and do nothing but chant and eat gruel all day. It doesn't mean that all you can ever do is go to Bible studies and prayer meetings, though those are wonderful and important. It doesn't mean you can only speak in scripture quotes. It doesn't mean any of those things. A life of undivided devotion to the Lord, I believe, makes everything better. It doesn't make, I'm not saying it makes it easier. Life is still hard. But I really believe that's true. I believe a life of undivided devotion to the Lord makes everything better. It allows us to experience more of God's presence and power. It allows us to enjoy God's good gifts without abuse or excess. It allows us to engage in happy moments in life and receive them as a gift from God. It frees us from the prison of selfishness. And make no mistake about it, it is a prison. It gives our work meaning. It makes our family life richer. I really believe this. It even makes our hobbies more fun. I think about this in the things that I am It's just silly stuff. How does, you know, I, I run quite a bit. Like how, does my, how does an undivided devotion to the Lord influence the way I think about my running, right? And I run very slow and it's extremely unimpressive. But how do I, how do I think about that? How does an undivided devotion to the Lord influence conversations with neighbors? How do I teach over at William Jessup? How does an undivided devotion to the Lord impact the way that I, I talk to my students? Do I get this perfectly all the time? Of course not. But I don't see that as a restriction. I see it as a beautiful invitation to just acknowledge and, and recognize God's power and God's presence in these everyday moments. See, this invitation to an undivided devotion, it's not about changing our circumstances. It's about changing the way we think about our circumstances in light of the work of Jesus. Man, one thing I forgot to mention, I think living with an undivided devotion, it gives us a way to deal with our dysfunction and deal with our mistakes that is a whole heck of a lot healthier than denial or shame, right? We can recognize God's power in our lives. We can ask the question, how does the reality of God's power and presence influence each part of our lives? And that is exciting. That is fun. And I really believe this is true. I believe it makes everything better, not in a health or wealth kind of way, but in a God is with me no matter what kind of way. I am going to walk through this season of grief, and I am going to grieve, and I'm going to feel my emotions, and I'm not going to pretend like they're not there. I'm not going to over-spiritualize myself into being in a good mood when I'm not. But you know what? I'm going, to rem- I'm going to do this with an undivided devotion to the Lord, and that means that I know that my Jesus is down in the pit with me. Pick any scenario you want. There is an opportunity to live with undivided devotion. And just last thing on this. Remember, God is more invested in our joy than we are. Like, God really cares a lot about our joy. It makes no sense to me that if that is true, that he would make an undivided devotion to him boring. I think the problem was with our perspective, not in what he's actually asking us to do. Verse 36. If anyone thinks that he is not behaving properly toward his betrothed, if his passions are strong and it has to be, let him do as he wishes. Let them marry. It is no sin. But whoever is firmly established in his heart, being under no necessity, but having his desire under control, and has determined this in his heart to keep her as his betrothed, he will do well. So then he who married his betrothed does well. And he who refrains from marriage, remember, in light of the present distress, will do better. And I just, we don't need to rehash the, you know, Paul's preference and everything else there, but I just want to quickly draw your attention. Like, look at the strength of the language Paul uses here. He's like, if you firmly established in your heart, which remember, in the ancient world, they say heart, that's more like we would say mind today. If you have firmly established in your heart, if you're not overly pressured from the outside, if your desires are under control and you're clear-headed about it, basically, yeah, go ahead and get married. And once again, an important broader point here, that part of Christian freedom is freedom from cultural expectations around marriage and singleness. And I know we've got some of those, don't we? But it's freedom from those sorts of cultural expectations. You don't need to be manipulated into making relationship decisions by society or even by other people. You're free to exercise wisdom. Now, we need to study God's word. We need to invite godly counsel. I am not suggesting some sort of sanctified individualism here. I don't believe there is such a thing. 
But I am saying we don't need to make decisions just based on social pressure. But then even in saying that, I want to acknowledge it takes a certain amount of moral courage to not be shaped by social pressure. Making decisions that we feel kind of boxed in and we feel like we have to make them, like that's annoying, but it's also easy. To say, no, no, I'm going to make what I believe is the best decision, what God is asking me to do in light of what scripture and godly counsel would, would, would tell me, like that takes some moral courage. And it causes us to accept responsibility for our own decisions and actions. It's good, but it is difficult. Verse 39. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. And Paul here affirms, we've talked about this the last few weeks, that Christian marriage is meant to be for life. There are biblical exceptions for cases of abuse or abandonment or infidelity. But outside those things, Christian marriage is meant to be a lifetime commitment. He continues, But if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. Yet in my judgment, she is happier if, guess what he's going to say? You're never going to guess. Guess what he's going to suggest that she does? This is shocker. Oh, she remains as she is. And I think I too have the spirit of God. I love that little addendum there. Like, oh, by the way, (laughs) I think I've got the spirit of God. So like, take that into account. But he emphasizes that if a person remarries, they're to remarry in the Lord. That is to someone who shares their same commitment to Jesus Christ. Now, if belief is just a box we check, what religion are you? Christian, doomed, then whatever. To marry a fellow box checker, who cares? But that's not Christianity. That is not Christianity. Christianity is about an entirely new understanding of reality. We've been talking about this all day. It's understanding that the world is different because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when we understand that life in the kingdom is not a Sunday thing or it's not a side dish to whatever we think is most important, then to attach ourselves for life to someone who does not share that commitment, it just doesn't make any sense. Because that sort of commitment fundamentally alters the way we think about so many things, about our time, about our money, about our relationship. It changes everything. So to seek marriage to someone who does not share that perspective just makes no sense. And I think it's interesting too, Paul is also likely coming to the defense of widows in the Corinthian church who their husbands would pass away and now there was all sorts of social pressure for them to get married right away. And he's like, hey, it's okay, you just do what you need to do, all right? Here's the bottom line as we wrap up. Marriage and singleness both offer unique opportunities to grow and serve, but our life is not defined by our relationship status. You could take out marriage and singleness, you could talk about working and not working, you could talk about being rich or being poor, you could talk about living in California or living in, who cares, somewhere else, and so much of the same principles would apply. Our life does not begin when we get married, our life does not begin when we live in our preferred zip code, our life does not begin when we reach a certain level of material or professional success. Life in the kingdom begins when we commit ourselves to undivided devotion to the Lord. Life in the kingdom begins when we engage in this process of repenting and believing, repenting and believing, repenting and believing, knowing that is not some obligation, that is not something we do out of religious performance but that is a gracious invitation from our heavenly father who loves us and there is freedom from anxiety in that sort of life this sort of life is not boring it's life as God intended it and once again we experience that life as we repent and believe repent and believe because we know that the kingdom of God is at hand and that changes everything changes everything. So I'm going to close us in prayer. And as I'm, as I'm praying, I want to invite the prayer team to come on up. And if you've got something you need prayer for today, the, the folks who serve on our prayer team, they come here hoping to have the chance to pray for you. So, so come and see them if, if that would be a blessing to you. But I just want to pray for us as individuals and for us as a church family that we would be men and women who understand the time has come, the kingdom of God is at hand, that we're invited to repent and believe. And that God would give us, man, I I, I need this so bad. God would give us a clear picture of what undivided devotion really is. Because, man, I think it's a beautiful picture. So let's pray. God, we thank you that your kingdom is at hand. We thank you that we are living this life on earth at the convergence of two realities. 
So I pray, Holy Spirit, would you help us to be men and women who can repent and believe, who in light of who you are, in light of all you've done, that we can change the way we think about the world, that you would help us to see ways that our thinking is off track and off base. You would help us to change our thinking, to renew our minds, as the scripture says, so that we think about things with your mind and with your heart. And then would you help us to believe, to place the full weight of our trust in this new way of thinking, in this reality that the kingdom has come. And God, would you give us a clear picture of what undivided devotion to you looks like? Would you give us a picture of that as a church? We want to be a church that is about undivided devotion to you. And we want to be men and women who have a clear picture of what that looks like for us as individuals. God, would you even this week begin to show us the beautiful opportunities that lay before us as we approach the different environments that you have called us into with an undivided devotion to you. God, I know that if I am going to live in that way, I need your help. Because when I get off in my own little anxious mind, things tend to go sideways. And I'm guessing I'm not the only one in this room who would say that. So Holy Spirit, would you empower us? Would you shape us? Would you, would you form us in a manner that we can be men and women who repent and believe for your glory and our joy? We pray these things in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said? Amen. Amen.